second. India have won the test match. India have won the series. They're going to get back for two. India are home. Lords goes wild. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the 81 All Out podcast. I'm Siddhartha Vaidyanathan, who's at Sidvi on Twitter. And uh, today, I'm going to be joined by uh, two guests to talk about the first match of the 2019 World Cup, England against South Africa. We hope to bring you uh, match reviews and previews through the World Cup. And this is the first one that we're putting out. So we hope you enjoy it. Joining me today is uh, Subhash Jairaman, the cricket coach. Hi, Subhash. Hey, Sid. How are you doing? Good. Good to have you here. And uh, later in the show, we'll also bring in uh, uh, essay, cricket essayist and uh, blogger Kartikeya Date. And uh, we'll have his views as well. But first, Subhash, uh, how did you enjoy the most exciting uh, World Cup event since the opening ceremony? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think it was on par for the, uh, for the, the damn squib. Both of them turned out to be... Uh, I think it's on par, yeah. you know. Uh, after England batted and scored above 300, you know, because um, kind of a par score, everybody was surprised that England did not score 350. But bigger ground, first game of the World Cup, and South Africa bowled well, so that was fine. But South Africa's batting effort um, was on par with uh, the opening ceremony from the day before. You know, uh, rain and less people and they're trying to make a bigger show than what it was. Uh, in the end, everybody goes home wet and unhappy. Uh, <laughs> I thought uh, that's, that was the proper equivalent. Well, at least people went home happy. I think uh, at least the majority of the crowd who were English uh, supporters must have gone home happy and with a lot of uh, hope and expectation for the rest of the tournament, right? I suppose so. I mean, uh, England, you know, they're the first time the favourites and uh, they have somebody, you know, Mo you know, Captain Morgan, you know, he's been embracing that favourite uh, title uh, rather than shying away and saying that, uh, you know, it's a burden on them, stuff like that. So, um, and fans are, key, English fans are keen, are hoping that, uh, you know, they'll win uh, their first 50 over World Cup trophy on home soil. Um, all that. So I'm sure they have gone home. You know, you, you win uh, by 104 runs against a pretty decent South African team. You know, it's not the South African team of the old uh, with the automatons that can, you know, do a lot of things with, uh, you know, Herschel Gibbs, Callis, that kind of uh, ABD Villiers stature players. But still, they had a pretty decent squad uh, to beat them by 104 runs. And in the end, it was a rout. So the English team and their fans ought to feel really happy about this performance. Yeah, when you uh, see a team like South Africa's batting, especially coming immediately after the English batting, you see the stark difference in the depth between the two sides, right? The moment uh, Amla uh, had to retire hurt and, uh, you know, when uh, Markram was uh, batting pretty beautifully, I thought, in that brief stint, the moment he got out, then immediately you realize how... Uh, South Africa is uh, so short on batsmen. I mean, once uh, number four, you get to four and five, then uh, you're just looking at uh, hardly anyone there. Dumini making a comeback. They didn't pick uh, Miller today. So, it, uh, but on the other hand, England, you have, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if uh, Bairstow gets out early. It doesn't matter if, uh, you know, one of the other batsmen doesn't do well because until eight, nine, ten, you have players who can make uh, quick runs and also meaty runs. Yeah, I mean, true. But, however, comparing the England batting lineup to any batting lineup in this tournament, um, perhaps with the uh, exclusion of, exception of West Indies, is chalk and cheese. You know, in England, they have pretty much proper batsmen till eight. The ninth and Jack are quite capable with the bat. Um, and I don't think maybe West Indies comes close to that, but there is no other team. The other eight teams do not have that kind of depth. So it's uh, even if you had A.B. de Villiers and Amla in his prime and Jacques Kahl is in his prime and stuff, I don't think South Africa's batting depth would have still compared to England's batting depth and its efficiency and their method of like going after the ball, no matter the situation. Uh, I don't think you can compare that. However, you know, even within the given the limited length 
of batting within South African lineup, I tweeted out, uh, you know, as soon as England innings ended, uh, Quinton de Kock or bust. Because he had to score bulk of the runs or a big 100 at a good pace so that the rest of them can like, coast at like five runs and over. Um, where, you know, nobody needed to take undue risks. You know, Amla is not the guy he used to be. Makram is great. Uh, Faf can come in, settle, guide the chase, so on and so forth. Um, but once... Uh, Amla got hit in the head uh, and Jeffrey Jafra Acher, you know, he brings a new dimension. I'm sure we'll talk about this in detail later. Um, got the two wickets, essentially three wickets for 20 runs in his first five overs. Uh, and then it was once Quinton de Kock got out, basically the chase was done. And you know, they were on course, you despite uh, losing two early wickets, they're still on course. Uh, with uh, Van der Dusen and uh, Quinton de Kock putting on a very good partnership. But then they played some absolutely dumb cricket, you know. Quentin de Kock trying to hit onto the long side of the boundary, getting caught uh, when it was unnecessary. And then JP Dumini getting out and then uh, the unnecessary run out. Uh, they just played very... They did not play percentage cricket, as Karthike, I would say. They didn't play percentage cricket, uh, shot themselves in the foot and then opened the door for England and, you know, Ben Stokes walked right through it. So that was that. They, as much as they would be disappointed with their uh, batting, I think uh, there's a lot of uh, consolation they can take from their bowling effort, right? Firstly, to restrict England to 311 uh, was, I think, uh, a very good effort. Uh, some good catching, uh, good bowling too in the middle overs. And uh, their bowling seems to have uh, a, a few dimensions about it. I mean, uh, it's not just... Uh, uh, they have a variety going, which I think will help them through the tournament. Especially with Lungi Ngidi. I enjoyed the way he bowled today. Yeah, of course. CSK player. What do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think South African bowling obviously has, you know, very good quality led by Rabada and also the experienced hand of uh, Imran Tahir. And Lungi has got the pace and the bounce and Peklip uh, you know, he's... He's not express pace, but uh, he kills you softly with his slowers. Slower and slower and slower. Um, so they got a pretty good set of bowlers. Uh, and they did a great job um, holding England to, you know, 310, which was a very reasonable score. Uh, because at Oval, you know, chasing, you win 60% of the time. Uh, batting first, you win 40. So it's a 50-50 call. Uh, and still, uh, you know, they made a pretty good fist of it. Um, I thought Ngidi on his second spell was fantastic. Just bowling cutters, slowers, digging into the pitch, uh, back of length, not giving any pace to the batsman to work with. Um, I think Ben Stokes also mentioned that about about uh, that spell toward you know during the post match uh, press presentation about how difficult it was to uh, score boundaries. And I think they went through a six or seven hour spell towards the end where they didn't get a single boundary. Uh, so that told you how well South Africa had control. And by taking wickets regularly through, um, even though England didn't really spend much time, the new batsmen didn't really spend much time in, you know, getting their eye in, getting set. You know, Morgan, two wickets fell back to back and uh, Morgan came in and second ball, he hit on the up through the cover. So that's... England's method, that's how they're going to play. Uh, it's more often than not, it has come off in the recent past. So they're going to continue with it. Um, so given all that, I thought South Africa bowled really well. However, um, I think the biggest thing that allowed South Africa uh, to control England was that uh, catch of, of uh, Morgan by Markram. That was a phenomenal catch, running in off the boundary, towards the ball, falling forward, taking a catch. Um, you know, at that point, I tweeted out saying, you know, uh, he's one of the best fielders around, Mark Rum. And I was wondering who the other best fielders would be. And I made a short list. What do you think? Sid? I think uh, Faf uh, is an extremely good fielder, especially on the boundary, right? Uh, I think uh, Faf is uh, very good in, in the South African team. Uh, I feel, uh, I mean... It, uh, ben Stokes, of course, <laughs> uh, he took uh, that uh, catch and he's one of the good fielders. I think Jadeja is an outstanding ground fielder. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, I think I would... Um, the, the, the way he approaches the ball, he always seems to take the shortest distance between... Uh, shortest route between point A and point B and his throw is a gun throw. Yeah. Always in there and uh, he's one of the better fielders... Uh, 
I think, uh, yeah, who else? I, uh, I think, uh, I mean, from Australia, you have Glenn Maxwell. I mean, David Warner is also a very good fielder. He, you know, used to be a much more close-in fielder. Now he has gone pretty much exclusively mid-off, mid-on. Uh, he's still got a solid arm. But I would say Glenn Maxwell overall is a great fielder. Martin Guptill from New Zealand is a phenomenal fielder. You know, Trent Bolt is like a tremendous catcher, outfielder, but he does not feel close. I was looking at, like, people, fielders that were all around great, you know, like... Uh, they can be whether they can reach the Ricky Ponting, uh, the Mark Waugh Ricky Ponting standard. Yeah, Mark Waugh Ricky, pa- Ricky Ponting. Ricky Ponting, I think, is a level above Mark Waugh, in my point of view. But I know 81 all out is major Mark Waugh fan. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but I think Ponting is one of the greatest fielder ever. Him and Andrew Simons, two of the greatest fielders ever. And imagining, I mean, ABDV, ABDV is obviously a great fielder. Um, you know, these guys I put as top level right now uh, and next would be you know Warner Bolt Chris Jordan Rashid Khan from Afghanistan uh, even Rod Kohli to an extent uh, uh, Kyron Pollard too oh Kyron Pollard I'll put him in the first, first you know he feels everywhere yeah yeah so yeah I would say those guys anyway we digress um, uh, talking about uh, you know the I just want to talk a bit more about the England batting and how, uh, you know, I, I, the cliche of uh, batting, especially when you're chasing a big score, uh, it goes that, uh, you know, one of the top three has to get a big one. I mean, even today on commentary, uh, Graham Smith and uh, Jacques Callis, all of the, uh, they were talking about how uh, De Kock or one of the top three need to go on and get a 80 or 100 plus mm-hmm. if South Africa is going to have a chance. But I'm just uh, reversing the equation here. If England were chasing 311, I don't think they would look at it that way at all, right? I mean, they would just bank on players getting 50s, 3, 4, 50s, and uh, they can bat till all the way and just go for it. They don't need that big knock from anyone in the top three. That is true. I, that is absolutely true. And we saw evidence of that in their England innings today, you know. They had four people scoring 50s at the up top, including uh, plus one guy getting a duck, you know. And still, they're able to put on a pretty good score. That's because the length of the batting lineup, strength of the batting lineup of the guys that can come and score very efficiently without wasting deliveries, make a sizable contribution and then go. And then next guy of the rank, uh, next cab of the rank comes in, does the same thing. It's, it's like they are playing uh, two and a half T20s. They figured out that ODI is not a 50 over game, but it's actually two and a half times of T20. And they're playing that. Uh, instead of having 10 wickets for every 20 overs, they just allot the resources accordingly. Uh, but... You know, if anything, it's only Morgan and Root that do any kind of balancing. Otherwise, the rest of the guys are, you know, well, I guess lately Ben Stokes also has slowed down. But the rest of the guys just, you know, push, 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 push. So they are playing ODAs as T20s, which is good. You know, that's what they figured is going to get them the trophy. And um, every, it, because no other team, well, exception of West Indies, I see. Tomorrow we'll see them how they do against Pakistan. Uh, but without, except for those, nobody else has that length that they can afford to, you know, uh, keep the foot on the gas constantly. So, you know, even if they, nobody scores 100, big 100s, uh, doesn't really matter to England. Uh, as long as they score sizable chunks and quickly, uh, they can proceed uh, with, to get the totals that they really are uh, on the lookout for. Yeah, I love the batting approach and I like the fearlessness that they come through. I think the biggest challenge for them will not so much be in the league phase where they can just uh, uh, go through opponents like this. Uh, it'll come, I think, in the knockouts when the challenge will be to maintain that fearlessness even with all the pressure of a knockout game. And if they can do that, hats off to them. They, they deserve it to win the World Cup and that's, uh, that's it. But I feel that if at all there's a chink in the armour, it'll come when... Uh, say semi final chasing uh, to 90 300, will they be able to be as fearless as they were for the last? Uh, I mean, uh, I beg to disagree there to an extent in the sense that I don't think there is a chink in the armor. We already know the chink in the armor. Chink in the armor is that uh, this approach they have is now going to come off all the time. We know that. We can look at all the games they have played since 2015 to 2019. You can look at the percentage of the games where they have collapsed. So we know that is that is the percentage chance, at least uh, statistically, they have to fail on any given day. So that could happen either in final, semi-final, or one of the group games. For England's point, of, from England's point of view, they would hope that if there is going to be a 
you know, uh, reverting to the mean, uh, regression to the mean, that, uh, that happens w- one of the group games. You know, they lose to India, which is one of the last group games. They lose by, I don't know, they get bowled out for like 120, 130. And that happens. You know, they got, England got bowled out by for 115 or 116, something like that. They were 59 for two and 115 all out against West Indies not too long ago. Yeah, but don't you think there is, a, I mean, I understand your statistical point, but do you think that uh, it is comparable with, uh, uh, say, a bilateral series or a, a league game with a knockout game? You think that I'm making too much of the mental aspect of a knockout game? I would say so. The mental aspect of a knockout game, I, I, I don't get it because there is no like one person that, you know, so to speak, you know, there is nothing riding on one person in the England team or two people. Entire team bats the same way. So it's very interchangeable inside. So there is no real burden on one person to, if this person doesn't perform, England is doomed. I don't think that's the case. That's true. And I think uh, in, in this uh, kind of uh, uh, format, uh, you know, uh, even, even South Africa, I mean, they might have lost by 104 runs today, but I think uh, the format allows uh, enough leeway for teams to have a bad day, maybe two, two bad days even, but still come back. And, uh, you know, we, we all know the story of uh, Pakistan 92. Yeah, you can have five bad days and still come back. <laughs> exactly. I mean, <laughs> five bad days, a rain, uh, a lucky break with the rain here, and yeah. uh, then you can still come back. And uh, yeah. so, so I, I mean... And it, rain is never too far in England anyway. So. Oh, yeah, exactly. So, uh, let's bring in uh, our uh, other guest now, Kartikeya, Kartikeya Date who uh, also uh, was, uh, who, as I had mentioned before, is a essayist and blogger who's written for places like ESPN, Quick Info and uh, The Hindu. So, hi, Kartikeya. Nice to have you here. Hi. How are you? Hi. Good, good. So, I uh, wanted to talk to you about the game and what you thought of it, especially uh, the big talking point of the game, uh, Jofra Archer, Pace Like Fire. Yeah, he's the wicket threat. That I was uh, actually, I I think the it was interesting that England first of all that they picked him, but I thought it was interesting that they picked him in place of like Wood and not in place of Plunkett or Hooks, you know, because he can bat, but they were still sort of not prepared to weaken the batting, so they were not prepared to go with Archer, Wokes. And, uh, uh, no, sorry, Archer, Wood, and some other player. Instead, they went with Vokes, uh, uh, Plunkett, and Archer. You know, because I think they can afford to play Archer higher up and play an all-out wicket-taking bowler, a second all-out wicket-taking bowler, and uh, they would still have a, they would still have a very strong team. You know, probably a better balanced team also. Um, what, did you, what did you make of... Uh, uh, I mean, of course, uh, Archer came in uh, with a lot of expectations, and uh, I mean, we've seen what he was, uh, what he's capable of in uh, T20s. Uh, but uh, ha- doesn't really have too much of uh, Liste cricket uh, behind him, and just a few one dayers. And uh, uh, what did you think of it? I mean, did you think it was just a natural progression for him to come into one dayers and do what he's always done, or uh, did you feel he adjusted really well? So he has 130 first class gets at 23 for whatever Sussex or whoever he played for. Sussex. So that's that's. I mean, he's he's a really really good bowler. I mean, he's a big. Kid. I mean, I think that's actually one of the things that I thought was missing from the way South Africa played was that they were not chasing wickets. And when England come at England, have this attitude where you know they just go for it. You know, like I'm Jason from Jason Roy to all the way down. They they try to score of every ball, and uh, more often than not, they're trying to hit it for four. You know that's the way they play. But and they do that because they pack their team with so much depth, right? But the the response from the other teams typically is to try and defend and to try and defend and defend and defend, and it never seems to work. You know, uh, and that may be because they don't have enough wicket taking threats, like. South Africa didn't have any real wicket-taking bowlers in the middle over. They tried to use Rabada first change to do that, but it didn't really work, did it? You know, I mean, by then the ball was old and there was nothing much happening. And, you know, they were always playing catch-up. You know, I mean, the one run was offer or an offer every ball, no matter what. You know, and you can't, I think the, 
the the challenge against england is to try to force yourself to keep chasing wickets you know and england has traditionally they've been set up in the last 3 years or so for high scoring games like they they are set up to make 330 and then defend it right instead of being set up to make 280 and defend it right i, I think kartika if i may interrupt you um i think which is you know i think saurav hungli also mentioned this and every team needs to go for wickets here uh, rather than trying to uh, really, really limit the opposition from scoring a certain number of runs uh, and i think there are no team in the world has that kind of firepower in their bowling lineup nobody does so which is why england are odds on favorite to win this yeah but i don't think it's a question of firepower i think it's it's a question of how bowlers bowl i mean kagi sarabada can get people out you know but if he bowls with four, four five people on the boundary he's not going to get a lot of people out i agree you know i mean the point so the even i mean even i mean it's not like adil rashid is some world beating bowler but he spins the ball really hard you know i mean i mean so this i think one of the things you are going to find is that teams which have a bowler who can do something with the ball you know either bowl really fast or spin it really hard that is going to be really valuable no i think the so the <clears throat> the cricket, one day cricket went through a phase where you know the these middle over restrictors were like gold you know chris harris mark elam and our, from the mid 90s to almost like 2012 that that period there was this tendency to play like third, for 20 out of the, the last 20 out of the 50 overs or, or you know two out of six bowlers used to be this you know restrictive kind of bowler and there used to be maybe one or two sort of proper wicket takers you know even and even the even the sort of main test balls test match spinners used to bowl like that you know harbhajan singh used to bowl like that you know to try and restrict but that is gone now because teams are not the batting teams are not prepared to just take what is on offer you know they they've cultivated new shots new new ways to hit to boundaries which are unprotected you know they are playing reverse sweeps and reverse paddles and this and that and those are cultivated shots you know to get a four where you know that the field is not going to be set to protect that part of the field right so in that sense i think the sort of the that stalemate that middle over stalemate has been broken by england so the the way to counter it is to try to keep chasing wickets you know and you might go for like 350 anyway you might as well try to get them out you know uh, and i mean the i mean one of the things i thought today for example was that after they lost a wicket on the in the what first over itself right imran tahir got that wicket yeah uh, the ne- four of the next five batsmen got to 50 now what that suggests to me is that there was no real wicket taking threat you know i mean there was their batting was untroubled it was like a test innings where you know everybody gets to 60 70 it suggests that there's nothing in the wicket you know uh, you have like and then you're the, you're like 400 for 5 or something like that the in 100 overs 120 overs something like that right i mean it's not really a it's untroubled progress and you, you have to trouble think, you would think that uh, having won the toss and decide, deciding to field yeah uh, you would think a lot of teams uh, do that with the intention of uh, going for wickets and getting the opposition out uh, cheaply do you think that uh, south africa were, didn't take the decision for that reason i i don't think they take, took that decision for that reason i think they i think they they the decision suggests that they were they thought england were the better team uh and that they had to do they had to play the game in a way where they stayed in the game for as many of the 100 overs as possible you know and yeah that and then you know in, in the end if they are within some touching distance to try and nick a win that that seemed to be their approach you know i mean otherwise you if you win if you win the toss and bowl and say well we are going to try and get whatever help there is in the morning with the new ball because it's a day game then you you don't open the bowling with imran tahir no yeah I mean, that that that's, seemed like a deepak patel <laughs> Martin I mean that's a, that's a that's a that's a that's that's a game that then that's a, that's like a toy play no i mean that's like you're you're saying i'm going to take chances yeah that's not a that's not a plan 
I mean, it seems like Faf has been in the CSK system for too long because uh, he tried to play the MSK, MS Dhoni uh, strategy here, which is, try. you know, we have an older, uh, unequal team that is not as good. Uh, so we'll try to stay in the game as long as possible. Hopefully you can nick a win. Yeah, I mean, and, and the, the thing is also that England don't play, decide how they play based on who they're playing. No, I mean, they play their game. They play the way they want to, you know. And it's not like they have like these awesome players. It's just that they have, they have a very, very refined approach, you know, which they have been working on ever since Morgan became captain. You know, by now that approach is like second nature. That's how they play. It's not even, they don't even have to think about it. You know, that, that's a quite a remarkable achievement by them. But the the way I mean the way to win against them I think is to try and keep trying to get them out. I don't think you can risk. I don't think you can restrict England and you know I don't think you can sort of try to run a hundred over race with England and you know try try to win in the end. You may win that way, but you're not. Odds are they are going to win, and especially now with Archer, with a, who's a genuine wicket taking threat. Uh, they, they are no longer, you know, set up to score 330 and defend 330. I think they can now defend like 270 also. Yeah, I mean, it's no longer a, like a 50-50 50 race because yeah. Archer's 10 overs sh- reduce, uh, shrinks the contest. It's like you're closer in uh, baseball. It's like yeah. a shorter inning game. And even, even, even with Rashid, you know, the fact that he bows leg spin and turns the ball hard means that people are not used to playing that. Now, I mean, most of the time, Rashid is, gets wickets and Moin gets wickets because people try to hit them. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, in a 270 game, they won't have to try to hit them so much. So, they won't get as many, they won't get as much joy. You know, I think that if, uh, if teams keep trying to defend against England, they're not going to get anywhere. You know. Yeah. And uh, com- coming to uh, the uh, bowling and the uh, uh, fielding. We've spoken a bit about the bowling, but uh, England had some good uh, fielding as well, especially the Stokes catch right at the end. I mean, I, I, people are, are going a bit overboard about it because uh, fielding the greatest standards... Ca- the greatest catch ever. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's the, that, it's that's the greatest a, catch a, in the... Let's put it this way. It's uh, mm-hmm. probably the greatest catch in the second innings of the opening match of the 2019 World Cup. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yep, that's all it was. And, you know, it's, the funniest thing about this is Stokes, when asked by Nasser Hussain, Nasser Hussain calls him in... For, I don't know whether you guys saw it or not. But the man of the match... No, I, I didn't see it. Um, so Nasser is like, oh, you you know, wickets, runs, catches, runouts. But I want to ask you about that catch. You know, yeah. what did you think? And, you know, he was like hyped. Like, um, he was asking, he was looking for Ben Stokes to meet him halfway. With the kind of ex- excitement. And Stokes said like, well, actually, I was way out of position, you know. I was uh, panicking. <laughs> because, uh, I wasn't supposed to be that far in, but I was. So, I was just went for it reflexively, you know. Which is fine, you know. That's how he got to the make the catch. But it is still a tremendous catch. Yeah, it's a like, very, very good catch. You know, I've seen a catch exactly like that uh, less than six weeks ago. Karen yeah, one. Like uh, Suresh Sharma square, uh, square cut one. Uh, Karen Pollard was in the cover point boundary and took the catch just like this. He was also out of position. He took, Karen Pollard was six foot five or something, right? Uh, it looked even more dramatic for a big guy in a much smaller ground. Yeah, I mean, it, it was it was sort of the fielding equivalent of the Im- Imran Tahir getting bare sword, with the with the one exception that Stokes is like an actual genius. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, I mean, he is a fantastic, a fantastic player. cricketer. I agree. I know he's a fantastic player. He can do everything, and he does everything well. Uh, it's it's a he's a remarkable. I mean, they have like England. Whatever you think about them, right now they have like some fantastic players. So, on that note, uh, let's uh, wrap up this episode of the 81 All Out podcast. Hope you enjoyed the review of the England-South uh, Africa game. And we're going to give you, uh, get you more reviews and reviews through the World Cup. Please subscribe on iTunes or Spotify or Google Podcasts or wherever else you would prefer. It would be wonderful if you could give us a rating and a review so that more people can find us. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at 81 All Out and check out our previous podcasts and articles at uh, 81allout.com. We love to hear from you. So please send us feedback on either Twitter or website or wherever else. Uh, 
Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, guys. Goodbye. Thanks. Thanks. In the air, Sri Shah takes it. India win. He'll come back for the second. India have won the Test match. India have won the series. They're going to get back for two. India at home. Lords goes wild.